Hey, howdy everyone. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. And this is a set of lectures on machine learning. And we have been covering the topic specifically around K nearest neighbor. Now, what I want to just do right now is we've explained the methodology in the previous lecture. We even talked about the idea of computational complexity because that's come up. Now let's finish off with some advanced comments around K nearest neighbor, then show a demonstration. Okay, so first of all, we may find it computationally very expensive to work with all of the original data. And so one way to improve the computational efficiency or is what we can say the computational complexity, time complexity of K nearest neighbor is to reduce the number of training data. Now, if you think about it, if you looked at an original data set that we could work with, what you'd recognize right away is that we may not need all of that data in order to do a very good job. In fact, there's some data that probably are redundant. We could remove them and we would still get the same result. This is the idea with condensed nearest neighbor. What we're going to do is look for a consistent subset. We're going to initialize the a condensed set of data by just randomly selecting k data where k is going to be much smaller than n. So we're going to select a very small subset. Then on a random order over the training data, we're going to remove the training data and we'll make a prediction at that location using k nearest neighbor, removing that data and using only the ones that we had in the condensed subset. Then we can go ahead and assign that, increment that to this condensed subset if we would have misclassified it. Now we may make the decision to declare it as an outlier using a heuristic where we say that it's very different than its neighbors. We need to just remove it. It's just creating noise. And if it doesn't change the model, we'll just consider it to be what we call absorbed. In other words, it's not necessary the model's already correct at that location then we continue to iterate over all of the training data locations and we're going to iterate until the model no longer changes it's stabilized okay so by doing this we'll find the fewest number of representative training data required to preserve the same decision boundary we'll reduce the time complexity of the procedure but with almost the same accuracy and so here's an example directly from Wikipedia. And this is a nice example right here. We have the original data set right here. We're doing classification with K nearest neighbor. And these, these would be the decision boundaries between all of the training data using all of the data. What we've done over here is we've identified the X's or all of the outliers that are going to be removed because they're locally considered to be anomalous. The circles are the absorbed points, the ones you really don't need to change the model. And the squares are going to be retained as the, we'll call, we could call them prototypes, or we could call them the condensed subset. They're the ones that we're going to retain in order to build our K nearest neighbor. It's the condensed subset, K much less than N. Now, if you look at this, you can see immediately that it actually doesn't take a lot of data to get decision boundaries, training data, I should say, to get decision boundaries that are somewhat similar. We are sacrificing some accuracy, of course. Now, why are we motivated to do this? And the whole point is the fact that we need to speed up the algorithm. We need to make it efficient. In fact, you'll find that if you have a lot of training data, it can be expensive to calculate the nearest neighbors. Now, we can do something to make that more efficient. We can pre-calculate the associations and nearest neighbors to all the data using something like a KD search tree or something like that. Now, dimensionality reduction is also an important point when working with K nearest neighbors. It's quite common that if we have 10 or more predictor features to first apply dimensionality reduction to the problem. This includes feature selection and feature projection. So if we do feature projection, we'd now be working in a predictor feature space that could be like principal components, some type of linear um, independent combination of the original predictor features. 
Now recall the curse of dimensionality. This is why we want to do it. Time and storage complexity increases with more dimensions. Okay, the model's harder to work with, harder to visualize too. Multicollinearity could be an issue too. And sampling and coverage, we've talked about that. And it makes sense fundamentally if we're dealing with not enough data in a high dimensional space, and we're trying to do these nearest neighbors, we won't have enough data around ourselves to get reliable local estimates. And so we want to work in lower dimension. But there's another part of dimensionality reduction or the curse of dimensionality, I should say, that we haven't really investigated in this course up until now. And now we hit it head on. Now we have to cover it. And that is distances in high dimensional space are weird. Euclidean distances actually become equidistant. They are kind of insensitive. They become the same in very high dimensional space. And let me explain that to you. There's a couple of ways we can go at it. First of all, if we're thinking about distances, Euclidean distances in high dimensional space, think about the vastness of hyper dimensional space. Okay, to do that, take the ratio of the volume of an inscribed hypersphere in a hypercube. So we've got our volume of our hypersphere, and this is the volume of the hypercube. This is the lambda function right here. Now, many people, when they show this, they show the dimensionality is D. I've replaced it with M because everything I do, I'm thinking about M features that I'm working with. What's fascinating is that as M dimensionality goes to infinity, this ratio of, imagine a cube with a sphere in it that just fills right up to the edges, the ratio of its volume relative to the volume of the cube actually goes to zero as m goes to infinity. That should kind of blow your mind. And what that means is in a very high dimensional space, imagine a very high dimensional space. It's all corners. There's almost no middle. And all of the high dimensional space is far from the middle. In fact, the limit in the expectation as M dimensionality goes to infinity of the maximum distance you would calculate of random pairs of points within that very vast high dimensional space to the minimum distance you would calculate, that expectation shrinks to zero. In other words, all of the distances between the points start to just look the same. There's no differentiation anymore. This is amazing. So distances are almost all the same. Euclidean distance no longer has real sensitivity. It, it loses its real meaning in these very high dimensional spaces. Okay. Well, anyway, that blew my mind when I started to learn about that. I hope that you found that really interesting. Let's go ahead and look at an example of K nearest neighbor. So what we'll do here is we'll give ourselves a very simple prediction problem that would be common to an estimation made in oil and gas production. We got porosity, we got brittleness as two predictor features, kind of an interesting thing to mix and match a petrophysical property that relates directly to the volumetrics of the oil in place, directly to brittleness, which is more of a geomechanical rock property. And we're trying to predict with those two predictor features the production rate from a well. And so this is the model we're trying to build right here. And we're going to work with training data and testing data right here. And we have already standardized our variables to have a mean of zero and a variance of one. And so we could go ahead and apply K nearest neighbor. Now what we've done to visualize the model, since we know it's a lazy predictor, it calculates the result on the fly. All I did was run the model many, many times to make predictions on a very fine grid and turn that into this nice colored map so we could see the predictions were made. So remember, this is a lazy predictor. It's doing it going back to the data library every single time to make a prediction. So please don't think that this is a model that's actually a par parameterized surface or something like that. So we have the example here of the training data plotted as a location map on top. And we should notice that we have pretty good consistency between the train and training data and the model since the model is coming directly from it. And here's the testing data. You might see a little bit more difference, not really contradiction. They're pretty consistent, but the testing data shown right here. And we can take a look. What we did was uniform weights, five nearest neighbors. And of course, we've already standardized the predictor features. 
And so when we look at the result right here, going across standardized predictor feature space, making the predictions, you can see these discontinuities. Why do we get the discontinuities? Because remember, we're using uniform weights for our convolution function, right? We're not using any type of a inverse distance or something like that to try to smooth out the influences the window's moving around of data that are entering and leaving the window. We can see overall that we have some discontinuities in the model. They, we can also see that in general, the model is quite flexible. It's able to fit a lot of the complicated features within this data set. Now here's an example where we use distance weighted and I increased the number of nearest neighbors to 15. And you can see if we pan back and forth, you see how with the distance weighted approach for the window, the weighting window, we smooth off the edges and we're using more data. So we get kind of a overall smoother model. I created a, a much smoother model. Now we could take it to the extreme. We could try uniform weights with one nearest neighbor and look at what we get. This is a nearest neighbor estimator. In fact, these right here would be like Voronoi polygons, which are just describing the boundaries, like the intersections of a bunch of perpendicular bisectors between the data, describing the polygons of influence around each of the data, and they're just being assigned the same value as the closest data, the data within the polygon. Now, we have to do a tuning of the hyperparameters. Remember, we talked about the fact that you see this model right here, k is equal to 1, one nearest neighbor. That model is getting to be overfit. It's just exact at the data locations. In training, there would be zero error whatsoever. If we go back to the model with 15 nearest neighbors, this might be a model that's underfit. It's too smooth. It's not responding enough to local information. So we got a hyperparameter here to tune. Irrespective of what we do with the distance weighting or uniform weighting, we still have to choose K. And so what we can do is we can go ahead and run a really nice little hyperparameter tuning with jackknife. It's, it's typical cross-validation. You remember I showed you training and testing data that had been separated from each other, only using random splits. So that's all I used. And we go ahead and run the model over and over again using different numbers of K, using the inverse distance weighting and the arithmetic average weighting, calculate the mean squared error, and we can look and see which one of these has the lowest mean squared error in predicting with the testing data. So we train with the training data and then we're gonna test it against the testing data that we withheld. And when we do that, we find it looks like a number maybe around three, K equals three or so. And we also see that we get a better performance with the inverse distance weighting. So that's giving us better accuracy. Now, we could do a much more proper type of approach where we do k-fold cross-validation. And we'll talk about that in more detail. So we'll use a number of folds. I believe the number of folds I used was probably around 10. And so with 10-fold cross-validation, we get nice smooth results. Showing about three nearest neighbors is probably the best for the model. And I did this using the whole time using the inverse distance weighting. All right. So we would right now be able to say we've tuned our hyperparameter. We have a k equals three. We do the best with the inverse distance weighting. We can put that back into our k nearest neighbor. And we have tuned our model, which we can now use. Now it's a lazy model. It's, it's a lazy predictor because it has to go back to the library of the data and so forth. But it still would be very useful, very flexible. All right, so I hope that this was useful to you, a description of k nearest neighbor for the purpose of prediction. And um, we will carry on in our next lectures with additional prediction methodologies in machine learning. All right, I am Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm also the Geostats guy on Twitter. I put a lot of content on, on Twitter. Um, I try to keep the number of um, hiking and kayaking pictures to a minimum, just try to sh promote outdoorsiness and the idea of professors being real people and accessible, I guess. But in general, I do put out a lot of information about my lectures, about my teaching, about professional advice to students and so forth. And so I hope it's helpful. I also have this YouTube channel, Geostats Guy Lectures, and I do have a GitHub account with about 30 repositories where I share all of these workflows are available for anybody who wants to try them out. All right. 
I hope this was helpful to you. Everyone have a good day.